OK, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, today we are joined by um, Patricia Edmondson. Um, she is the Museum Advisory Council Curator of Costumes and Textiles at the Western Reserve um, Historical Society. Um, and she has also been documenting the pandemic experience in Cleveland by collecting oral histories, images, and documents. And today, um, Patricia will be giving a presentation on the wow factor, 150 years of collecting bold clothes um, that Clevelanders have used to stand out in a crowd. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Patricia. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Go into a full screen here, okay. Um, so <clears throat> Wow Factor was an exhibit that we did at the Historical Society in 2017 to celebrate our 150th anniversary. Um, we are University Circle's oldest cultural institution at the Historical Society. Um, and you might notice some people ask us if we've changed our name. Uh, we are still the Western Reserve Historical Society, but uh, our headquarters in University Circle is branded as the Cleveland History Center. So that's that physical space because we also have Hill Farm and some other historic properties under the WRHS umbrella. <clears throat> I do like to start out by telling people a little bit about who I am and what I do. Um, so. This is me uh, be before two kids. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm the curator of the collection. Even though we are a fairly big institution, we actually have a pretty small staff. So I end up doing a lot, um, a lot of different things from vacuuming to um, slightly more glamorous activities. Um, the Chisholm Halley Costume Wing is where I do most of our exhibits. Um, and Chisholm Halley was the last president of Halley Brothers. So if there are folks that remember uh, Halley's department store, which closed in the uh, early 1980s, um, that family gave money to endow the, the gallery. Um, I've been at the Historical Society for about five and a half years now. So last week I just opened my fifth exhibition um, and uh, I'll, I'll um, touch on a couple exhibits, I think, before I get to Wow Factor. Um, this is within other spaces at the Historical Society. I put clothing throughout the museum in various places. Um, on the left is one of the rooms in our Hay McKinney mansion. We have two historic structures that are sort of cobbled together with other buildings um, from both from about the 19 teens. So the Hay Mansion is set up in period rooms. So the room here is 1870s. Um, and on the right, we have a, a large introductory space called Cleveland Starts Here. So we have different things related to the history of Cleveland. Um, obviously, that's our whole story pretty much throughout the museum, but we have this condensed space that tells that history. Um, we do loans to lots of places, including Zor Village. Um, here is a loan at Lawnfield. I wonder if I have another, there we go, image um, of a Molly Garfield's um, Part, part of her wedding dress. Um, and uh, the bodice belonged to President Garfield's daughter, Molly. And then in our collection, I was able to sort of recreate her wedding look with other garments. Uh, loans to major museums like the Cleveland Museum of Art on the left was their Jazz Age show. And then neighboring institutions uh, on the right down at Ohio State, we did a, a Dior show with, with them. Um, the collection has about 40,000 objects. That's just the costume and textile collection, not the rest of our collection. Um, and uh, most of it is um, women's wear, but we have men's wear, children's wear, accessories, and then all kinds of uh, what I glamorously call flat textiles like quilts, samplers, uh, things like that, things related to everyday life. Um, I like to just show some pretty, pretty things since you're not um, at the Historical Society in person. Some of my favorite things from the collection. Um, just do a, some eye candy. <laughs> um, and like I said, you know, I do all kinds of things from vacuuming. I do our um, mannequin dressing. I do our photography for costume. Um, this shows 
all of the garments that were in the Wow Factor exhibit. And today I'm gonna talk about a handful of them. Um, my goal with the exhibit was really to do a highlights show that covered the past 150 years. So um, I will touch on the earliest garment in the show, which is older than 150 years old, it was from 1853. But um, I was looking for things that automatically grabbed my eye, hence the wow factor. Um, but then my requirement was also that I had to know either who wore it or who made it and be able to um, tell some kind of meaningful story. So in a way, it's also a history of women in the Western Reserve. Um, there was some menswear in the show, but um, I focused mostly on, on women. <clears throat> so uh, the first uh, dress, the earliest dress in the show, which was also the smallest waist, 22 inches, people often remark on that sort of thing when they come into the gallery, because most of us aren't wearing corsets anymore, so <laughs> we don't look like this. Um, yes, she had a small waist, but also uh, it's that illusion that was uh, the popular silhouette in the 1850s where you had a cinched in waist um, and then a very full skirt. And then if you go into the next decade, that's pretty much the most, the fullest skirts that you get in fashion history. Um, but this dress, uh, it's a beautiful windowpane gauze. So it's a sheer fabric um, with hand painted roses on top of the textile. And it was worn by Isabella Harkness. At least this is a case where we think it was worn by Isabella Harkness. It was given to us by the family. And so with genealogical research, um, you know, my goal is to pinpoint who's the most likely wearer. And, and in this case, we think it was Isabella Harkness. And she's here in um, on the right as well with her sister and brother-in-law. Um, and Isabella Harkness, let's see, um, well, here, we'll talk about the, the fashion a little bit. In the 1850s um, in Northeast Ohio, you know, not everybody was a, a pioneer and roughing it. Um, there were plenty of wealthy folks who had access to fashion magazines like these. So one uh, French one on the left, an American Godey's Ladies book on the right, um, so that they could follow the latest fashions. So I think people sometimes have this perception that Ohio was not sophisticated, but you had links to the East Coast um, where people could get fashion magazines, you could get the latest textiles. So uh, you could have a beautiful dress made um, like Isabella Harkness did. Um, so a little bit about Isabella. Unfortunately, in this early period, it's often easier to find out more about the husbands. Um, but we know that Isabella had, uh, Harkness, she was uh, married um, to uh, a, a Mr. Harkness, who Daniel Harkness, who worked in the for Standard Oil, he was one of three Standard Oil partners. Um, the least famous, if you think about someone like Rockefeller, um, <laughs> but they certainly had um, a, a good income. Um, and she, in her obituary, she died at only thirty-four. Um, she, it was written that she was a pious woman, a good mother, um, good to her community. So of course, everybody's gonna say something like that in an obituary. So we'll never really know what she was like, but she certainly wore beautiful clothing that was at the height of fashion in the early 1850s. Um, so as we continue forward in time, we'll get to know a little bit more about the women themselves and not always in the context of husbands. Um, this was a dress worn in 1878 by Ellen Wade. Um, I wish, you know, I, I, I don't have as many detail shots as I would like, but if you can tell, this has so many details. You've got uh, a very tightly pleated skirt that goes into these larger pleats. All of the floral decoration here you see is embroidered um, with lots of um, what's called pass monterie or tassels. Um, and then there's different laces and silks. Um, and this is by a company, Moskowitz and Russell, who was located both in New York and Paris. Um, if any of you are familiar with our university circle, um, you might've heard of Wade Oval. Um, and that's the area where the art museum is built and all the cultural institutions are sort of around this green area. And that's the Wade family. You have to forgive me if I sound out of breath. I'm eight months pregnant. <laughs> Um, uh, the Wade family donated their family land to basically build Cleveland's cultural institutions. Um, so Ellen Wade married into the Wade family. She married Jephthah Wade 
uh, Jr. Um, so his grandfather had founded a Western Union Telegraph Company, and they were one of the wealthiest families in the country, uh, not just in Northeast Ohio. Um, so she wore this dress uh, shortly before she was married in 1879 into the Wade family, and she was a neighbor. Um, here she is in her wedding dress. And here's a uh, family photograph um, with her two sons. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the family helped found the Cleveland Museum of Art. Here's an early postcard of that land. So the family, you know, the Wade family homes used to be um, in this area. They own this land. And then they both helped start the institution through land donation, but also through collections. Um, this is a Wade family home where she lived. Um, she was a great traveler. Uh, we've got lots of family travel photos. I enjoyed this one from a little bit later period than the dress, uh, closer to 1900, but here she is on top of an elephant um, with her husband and other family members over here. And they would go on these long journeys every other year where they would visit different European countries and bring home, um, well, and um, Eastern countries and bring home art. So if you search for Wade in the Cleveland Museum of Arts, uh, collections online, you come up with tons of things that they would have purchased and brought home with them. So these are just some examples of art that the family owned. Ellen in particular, she loved lace and so she collected a lot of lace. This is a piece um, that she brought home from her travels. And she also uh, liked to do a lot of shopping in Paris. And so these, um, this hair comb in particular is a Lalique hair comb that's at the art museum nearby us. Um, she purchased from the uh, Paris Exposition in 1900. Some of her Tiffany jewels. Um, the left is in the collection of the Natural History Museum. On the right is still in the Tiffany archive. Uh, the, the records related to the family's travel are pretty intense. You know, she might spend an equivalent of $40,000 traveling um, just on clothing. Um, there are records of uh, her, her husband buying a diamond that cost in $1,900, uh, quarter of a million dollars. So um, no expense spared for her fashion. <laughs> um, she patronized one designer in particular in the early 1900s, uh, Jean Paquin, a woman French designer. Um, so this is one of those dresses. I think what's hard is, um, you know, this is not exactly how the dress would have looked originally. Things have yellowed, as you can see. All of this embroidery on the silk would have been a very shiny silver, but it's tarnished over time. So if you can try to use your imagination to imagine this glittering dress um, that would have sparkled in the candlelight, um, her fashion is pretty fantastic. Um, and then, you know, she was an art collector. I think that's one of her major contributions to Cleveland. And she also was involved in philanthropy, um, sort of the typical rich lady thing to do, you know, helping um, poor folks and orphans and that sort of thing. Um, the, the next garment, um, and we're moving chronologically, which is not how the exhibit was originally organized, but um, I like to show the progression of silhouette. So you have that small waist with the bell-shaped skirt then you went into sort of a more um, flowing shape. And then in the 1880s, you get the bustle, um, which is popular both in the 1870s and 1880s in different periods. And this is one of the more extreme versions. So the natural body would end sort of where the blue might end, um, but you would, uh, if you were going to wear this dress, you would wear um, uh, basically a flexible steel cage, which sounds like a torture device, but it's very lightweight. Um, and uh, the latest technology made that really flexible. So it folded up sort of like a slinky almost, and uh, you could sit in it, um, I, I promise. <laughs> um, and so we call this a walking ensemble. Um, it's in part because it doesn't have a long train like many um, dinner or evening dresses. Um, although I don't know how much uh, the wearer was um, walking on, uh, up and down Euclid Avenue wearing something like this. Um, in person, it's really cool. It's got what's called a changeable velvet uh, bodice. And so essentially that just means that the threads one direction are one color and the threads in the other direction are another color. And so it looks sort of iridescent and from one angle it looks blue, another angle looks purple um, and it, it makes it a little bit more magical. 
Um, so this ensemble was worn by Sarah Wilcox Hitchcock, uh, another great traveler. She certainly ran in the same social circles as the Wades um, and did a lot of traveling as well. I love this photograph of her on the camel in front of the Sphinx um, and some more travel photos. Uh, she, rather than bringing home fashion, she really liked to shop for um, uh, decorative arts. So coffee sets, um, you have silver pots, finger bowls. Um, she, here is a shawl, um, but uh, these are from um, Egypt. Um, and she also shopped for art as well. These are two Piranesi prints that she gave to the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, and uh, she was a bit of an adventurer and a bit of an eccentric as well, um, according to family lore, um, which sometimes is the best that we've got. <laughs> um, now the next dress is from just a few years later, but this one, uh, I don't have a side view, but you, you're losing that, um, that bustle silhouette and getting closer to sort of modern fashion silhouettes. Um, and this is something that, you know, as I walk through the halls of storage, I saw and was like, okay, we've got all these pastel colors in the 1890s, but here's this bright red dress. And um, I really hope it's got a good story. And I was lucky um, that it did. So it's this bright, bold red color. And it turns out it was worn by a young woman uh, at the time. She was Ada Watterson. And uh, we've got some family photo albums. So uh, here she is as a young girl. I don't know if you can see, but her <laughs> sibling is holding uh, what looks like a, a lizard of some sort. Um, oh, oh, it's a Texas horned toad, maybe. <laughs> and here she is um, as a young woman, and then uh, playing the banjo with her family. So she was definitely an upper middle class uh, young woman, but not the level of the Wades or the, you know, sort of millionaire's row folks, she was sort of like the slightly less rich cousin of, of those families. Um, uh, but what set her apart for me, uh, here she is with her sister the same year that she would have worn this red dress, um, is that uh, she, she went to college, she attended Smith College, and so here she is as a sort of a, a, college, um, a college girl. Um, I'm pretty sure that this, this is her, although frankly, Oh, you know what? They're all her. It's sort of a, um, a triple exposure, one of those like magical photograph um, sort of things. You take the picture three times without advancing the film. Um, so that's pretty playful. But, um, but anyway, so she went to Smith College, which was not unusual for young women in the 1890s of the upper classes. It was okay for you to go to college, especially an all women's college like Smith or Vassar. Um, but then Ada sort of veered off the, the normal path by then going to graduate school. So she uh, completed her master's in biology and zoology. And then she also went on to get a PhD, um, which is rare. I think a lot of parents felt that their daughters would be less marriageable if they had advanced education. Um, and uh, she also used that education. So I don't know, I had, didn't include it, but she published in um, botany journals. Um, and then while she was uh, doing some teaching at Columbia, she met um, Robert Yerkes who became her husband. So then she became Ada Watterson Yerkes and the two uh, pioneered a lot of study in the area of primates. Um, and so down um, in Georgia, there's a like primate study center that's named after them. Um, and so she was kind of bold in her fashion choice of re a red dress, but also bold in her pursuit of education and her use of her education throughout her life. So um, I enjoyed learning about her. Um, now, someone who was still a little more traditional, Mary Norton wore this dress, um, but the dress itself is fantastic. Uh, it's a sheer black material that's covered totally in sequins, um, in black and silver and uh, different shapes and sizes. And here you've got sort of uh, floral decoration made out of sequins. Now, Mary Norton wore this um, when she was in her 50s. So this age on the right, here she is as a younger woman. Um, in one of the exhibits that I've worked on recently called Women in Politics, I learned that Mary Norton was um, anti-suffrage, <laughs> um, which 
you know, I think most of these wealthy women along Euclid Avenue um, did not support suffrage because it was sort of a threat to their way of life. But, um, and we don't know how staunch she was. I don't think she was going canvassing door to door fighting against women's suffrage, but it does um, kind of help paint the picture of what life was like for a lot of these women. And then one thing that's funny is as soon as suffrage is passed in 1920, um, a lot of these women then joined the League of Women Voters. So you wonder, you know, were they just doing this to um, stay within socially acceptable, um, you know, guidelines and do what their family wanted to do. Um, and then later on, they're like, okay, now it's official. Now we can, we'll use our vote. Um, but Mary Norton was also a collector of art. Here's another portrait of her with her husband, um, David Z. Norton in their home. And so she collected a lot of Asian ceramics, as you can see on the fireplace, um, some little Egyptian objects, um, another big collector. These are some of her Japanese objects that she gave to the Cleveland Museum of Art and some Egyptian uh, embroideries that she brought back from travels. I'm not sure how much she would have ever worn these textiles. Um, I think they were collected more as pieces of art, um, but it is kind of a cool addition to our collection to have evidence of her, her travels. Um, and that was a, a way that people could kind of prove themselves, you know, as um, it was a cultural capital, like I am sophisticated and knowledgeable that I've traveled and collected these things and they're part of my home. So displaying them um, says that without having to, you, without you having to say it. Um, and just to give you an idea, you know, here's Euclid Avenue today. Um, and now pretty much none of the homes survive, but, you know, Mary Norton lived here. Um, the Wades lived on Euclid at a certain point, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and, uh, you know, a block over in Prospect, um, uh, you've got other, and then these are some other um, prominent families. They're all kind of living, you know, this is um, Mrs. Hitchcock, excuse me, um, in the same kind of neighborhood, same area. If you're in Cleveland today, actually, this little stretch of Prospect does have a couple historic houses that are still pretty cool to look at and are only high-end row houses that are left. I think it's like three together and that's it. <laughs> um, moving into the 20th century, things are starting to change a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, um, something that is really veering from the typical fashion with the tight corset, although she probably was wearing a foundation garment underneath. Um, but this is uh, something designed by Mariano Fortuny and it's a very tightly pleated silk. And if you were to hold this in your hand, I think it weighs less than a pound. I mean, it's like, you wouldn't feel like you were wearing anything um, when you were wearing it. And so some people argue that anybody could wear it because it conformed to any body type. Um, and then others who say that it wasn't forgiving. And so you had to look a certain way and still wear your foundation garments underneath. Um, but uh, it was worn by Elizabeth um, Mather. Um, here she is with her second husband. She was born Elizabeth Ring, married um, Robert Ireland. He passed away and then Mr. Mather was her neighbor. And the sort of family story goes that people suspected something was going on when Mr. Mather built um, a gate in the fence between their two properties and their friendship blossomed and then they um, married. It was both their second marriage, uh, but she moved into his house um, and here she is in another one of her Fortuny gowns. Um, and this is also a Fortuny gown, um, the same pleated silk on the side, but here a printed velvet. Fortuny was a Venetian designer and Elizabeth loved both nature, her gardens, as well as Italian art. And so she redid the interior of their home um, when she moved in with Mr. Mather to sort of look like an Italian villa or a Venetian um, uh, Palazzo. Um, and this painting in particular is now at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, but she also was really instrumental in helping create uh, what is now the Botan Cleveland Botanical Garden. So she was um, very adamant in her support of public gardens. Um, so interested in both gardening at home, but also making uh, a beautiful place that was accessible for all Clevelanders. So with Fortuny, she got to, and these are some more of her collections, um, uh, sort of wed the Italian 
and her love of nature. Um, these are two things worn by Phyllis Peckham. Um, chronologically, you know, the next kind of thing we're really looking at is this dress on the left, um, but we have Phyllis's clothing from the 19 teens up until the 1980s. So um, I had two of her dresses in the show. This is from the 1960s, um, but I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the 1920s. I think when people think 1920s, they often think of the typical flapper beaded evening gowns um, with the very straight silhouette, which was um, certainly prevalent, but then also you had an interest in a slightly more romantic silhouette. And this is a shape called, uh, well, I'll come back to um, uh, a robe de steel. And it's actually sort of modeled after the pannier, the wide dresses of French 18th century fashion. Um, so yes, the 1920s were very modern, but also they still looked back uh, as well. Phyllis um, moved to Cleveland as a young girl with her family from Detroit and her father owned a car dealership and she was an only child. Um, she never married and she spent a lot of her um, money on uh, clothing, especially French imported clothing. So we have this portrait of her. We also have the dress that she's wearing. Um, another, this would also have been one of those road to steel silhouettes. Um, she was a great supporter of theater in Cleveland. Um, she hosted her own radio show where she reviewed local theater productions. Um, and so she was philanthropic in, um, from that perspective. Um, she did a lot of shopping locally at a business called Quinn Ma's. So I mentioned Callie Brothers um, at the start when I talked about our gallery. And Quinn Ma's was a woman-owned business uh, boutique started by Catherine Quinn and Gertrude Maas, who both worked at Halley's and then left. Of course, legally in the period, I don't think that they could have um, owned their business without a, a male to sign on all the bank documents as well, sign of the times. Um, but they were the figureheads of the business. They were really running things. They would travel to Paris and uh, look for um, dresses like this one to import. This is one that Phyllis purchased. Um, they would also uh, copy Parisian things. So you could get a variety of things. They obviously, obviously marketed to young women um, for more affordable, sensible things, but then they could also work with people like Phyllis Peckham and bring home French couture. Um, so here's another example slightly later. Phyllis Beckham wore this to the opening of uh, Severance Hall where the orchestra plays. Um, and that's from Quinn Maas as well. And Quinn Maas was open until the 1950s or so in Cleveland. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> so there's um, the interior of Severance Hall. Um, the, the orchestra was founded in 1916, but Severance Hall itself opened in 31. Um, next, chronologically, we've got this dress from the 1940s. Um, and uh, it was worn by a woman named Mickleen Mashke, who went by Mike, Mike Mashke. And uh, this is a, another dress, dress of hers, a later one. Earlier, I talked about that changeable fabric in that velvet bodice. This is the same thing. So it looks both pink and orange, depending on how the light hits it. Um, but uh, th this is a case of a dress that has no designer label or anything like that. People want to always want to know, you know, who made it. Um, in this case, I don't know, but it's just a really cool dress. Um, I don't have the photograph to show it, but here you've got a hood. And so there was this sort of 1930s and 40s trend of, you see it with like Hollywood, Hollywood starlets wearing hooded capes or even hooded dresses. Um, and so Mike was uh, tapping into that. Um, this is Mike Mashke um, in a portrait that we have of her that is literally life size. Uh, we do have the dress she's wearing, although it's not in great condition anymore. And we have a ton of her clothing as well. She married into a very political family. Um, her father-in-law was head of the Republican Party in Cleveland. Um, and when did I include? Here we go. And so some of her fashion reflects that. This is a skirt that says, I like Ike. And um, it's got uh, the, you know, the Republican and Democrats sparring and then around the, the rest of the poodle skirt, there are different um, sort of portraits of uh, Eisenhower as a scholar, Eisenhower as a military figure, as a president. Um, and so um, she 
uh, presumably wore this during one of his campaigns. Uh, as a side note, um, that camp Eisenhower's first campaign was um, during the time when they had the first, it was the first time they documented an equal number of male and female voters, even though women had been voting since 1920. Um, and so their campaign in particular from the Republican party really catered toward women voters and they made a lot of, um, you could buy I like Ike sunglasses, gloves, all kinds of different fashion items. Um, but Mike, Mike Maschke, so she was a little bit involved in politics, but um, more involved in Cleveland in the National Council of Jewish Women, um, which is still going today, um, a philanthropic organization. Um, and, um, you know, proud of her uh, Jewish heritage. Um, and so we have tons of her clothing. Um, I've shown just a couple. This pink one, as well as this plaid here, are an American designer, Norman Norell. Um, I think today you can still buy Norell perfume, but um, but he was, uh, you know, had a huge impact in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, and then another American designer, James Galanos, here. Um, and he, um, he actually just passed away a few years ago. Um, and it's interesting because he made ready to wear garments, goodbye off the rack, but with um, pretty amazing couture techniques. Um, and I also like to look at something like this because then it, it harkens back to what's happening 100 years earlier. You know, this is the 1950s, but in a way with that cinched waist and the full skirt, it reminds you a little bit of that very first dress um, and that, that silhouette that was fashionable. And this is that post-war return to femininity. Um, you know, women are, um, maybe they were involved in the, the war, wartime workforce, but then um, in the 1950s, a lot of them are sort of expected to return to the, the home. Um, and fashion kind of reflected that by becoming more feminine and softer in a lot of ways. Um, now, uh, this dress, although very feminine, was worn by somebody who was in the workforce her entire life. Um, it was um, worn by Helene St. Andrews, who I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but uh, the it's a woman designed dress and um, she is really credited with inventing petite sizes. And she did this uh, by looking at World War II records, um, you know, women's um, measurements um, for uniforms and that sort of thing recorded and she used that information to um, sort of collate and create petite sizes officially for the first time. Um, but Helene St. Andrews was the fashion director at Higby's for most of her career. Um, but here she is in a Plain Dealer article um, during World War II when she, uh, she learned Morse code and then she was trained to train other people in Morse code. And so even though she spent her life in fashion. When she was interviewed in the 80s, she said that her favorite thing that she ever wore was her uniform during the war. So for a lot of women, um, you know, wartime, World War I, World War II was the first time that they were allowed to do something more independent. Um, uh, but uh, Helene St. Andrews would go on to work at Higby's department store. And uh, she worked as a buyer, a fashion show director, but she also started a teen program that they had at the department store. Um, she created the stag shop, which was the, the menswear um, sort of young men's division. Um, and here she is in a plain dealer article in the 1980s. Um, she really worked for most of her life um, and was known in Cleveland as someone who could, you know, you could have a conversation with her and then she could really find something that suited both your body and your personality. So it was a different kind of era when you went to the department store and worked with, you know, the same person over and over again to help you find what was best for you rather than a more sort of anonymous shopping experience. Um, she organized fashion shows at Higby's, as I mentioned. So here's a bridal fashion show from that, um, from the 50s. And then a Parisian import fair. Um, that was really something I started in 53. Um, you could experience both French imported fashions, but also you could have French wine, French cheese. I don't think I've been, um, they built an entire scale model of the city of Paris that lit up at night. Um, so like I said, a, a very different experience from shopping today um, and some of her other smaller scale sort of in-store uh, fashion shows. 
Um, this dress is by Christian Dior, a very famous name. Um, it was worn by a woman named Mary Norton. Um, you know, the way I have dressed it, it doesn't have uh, an entirely full skirt. She might've worn more petticoats underneath to give her that fuller look. Um, it has all of this applique that looks sort of like white wisteria. Um, that's, uh, you know, all handmade and um, very detailed. So Christian Dior is responsible for what's called the new look, which I think I'll touch on. But um, like I said about that sort of return to femininity, in 1947, he created this silhouette that was a very tiny waist and then a full skirt. And um, he's sort of credited with uh, popularizing that. Um, it was worn by Mary Bolton. In Cleveland, the Bolton name means a lot to us. Her mother-in-law, Frances Payne Bolton, was a very important politician, congresswoman, um, and uh, also helped create the nursing school um, through her funding at Case Western Reserve University. So Mary um, married her son, Kenyon, and uh, Mary herself was a big Francophile, so it makes sense that she was a fan of Christian Dior. Um, she studied French in college, and then she and her husband moved to Paris for his work um, in the late 1940s, early 1950s for several years. Uh, so here she's actually modeling for another French designer uh, named Jacques Faf who is not as famous as Dior today because in part his business didn't survive, but his techniques and his work were just as good, I think. And so by working with some of these modeling studios, I should point out that she had already had twins at this point, um, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, she was able to get sample sizes and get discounts and so kind of collect some French couture um, in a slightly more affordable way. Um, so here are some more examples of her clothing that she purchased from French designers, Nina Ricci, again, Jacques Faf, who I mentioned. Um, these are both Dior suits that she purchased. And then she would do something like with this one, for example, the blue and black. She loved this. She brought it home to Cleveland and she had her local dressmaker copy it for her in black um, because she loved the silhouette so much. Um, and we've got archival records related to her fashion as well. So it's fun to look at her receipts for, um, in, in this case, her hats, um, invitations to fashion shows. You know, here's a, a little Christmas card <laughs> um, to her, uh, her husband. Um, and uh, so her, her legacy kind of came to us in the form of this collection of French fashion um, that a lot of Clevelanders wouldn't have had access to otherwise. <clears throat> Um, now, this one is uh, sort of, it's a lot different from Mary Bolton's fashion in that it's an American designer, it's not using high-end materials, um, but it still has a, a visual impact. It's this pink dress that has a layer of purple tulle um, all over, and it sort of, in person, it really kind of glows in, um, in a, an unusual way. Um, but it was worn on stage by Dorothy Hummel. At the time, she was just Dorothy Hummel, not Dvorka. Um, Dorothy Hummel was a pianist. She also trained as a ballet dancer. She was a great musician. And so this um, purple dress was worn during her last uh, performance on stage with the Cleveland Orchestra um, in their summer series. So it would have been at Bl a Blossom. Um, and... Um, she retired sort of early to focus on musical philanthropy. And so in Cleveland, we have the Music School Settlement, the Cleveland Institute of Music. She helped raise a lot of money for those institutions um, and did some teaching as well. And then later in life married um, Mr. Havorka, who was a, a professor at Case. Um, and so uh, this is a program from one of uh, the fashion shows that she organized to raise money for um, the local musical institutions. So uh, she was in the spotlight a lot for that. Um, another one of her very 1960s <laughs> dresses with the gold lame and the rhinestones. Um, but uh, she, she only passed away a handful of years ago and um, really had a great impact on Cleveland's musical community. Um, I think one of my last ladies to talk about is um, the woman that wore these, which is um, Greta Milliken. 
And so we had both in the show, again, one of those women who we have, you know, her whole closet, essentially, um, this French courage, um, very mod sequin covered uh, cocktail dress. And then this um, ensemble, which is by the designer Azadine Alaya, who he recently passed away as well. Um, and she was somebody that worked with him before he was doing runway shows. She would go to his studio. She was wealthy enough that she could say, okay, great. I like this suit. I'll take it in two different colors. I like this dress. I'll take it in you know, every available similar design you have. Um, and so I don't know if I've included it, but so we've got pictures of her closet <laughs> and you can see sometimes, you know, if she liked a pair of shoes, here's just some plain slippers, but one, two, three, you know, four different colors of the same design. Um, and uh, what's fun is I can point out some things from her closet this is from the 1980s and say, we have this dress, we have this dress, you know, I know this one, this one. Um, but uh Greta Milliken, we have this portrait of her, which is from an earlier period in the 40s, late 40s, when she uh, first moved to New York. Um, she was um, uh, from Austria, but during World War II, she decided to sort of get out of the country um, <laughs> um, before uh, things got really bad. So she moved to New York and worked as an interior designer. Um, and then it was um, a couple decades later that she met uh, this fellow, Severance Milliken, uh, or uh, yeah, Severance Milliken, and his uncle was John Severance who built Severance Hall, um, so a big Cleveland family. So he hired her to be her, um, his designer for his home, and then in uh, subsequent years, he divorced his wife, she le uh, left her husband, and they married one another. So they both um, found love again, and um, spent uh, a lot of money on French art and also French clothing as well. So here are some more of her um, uh, French uh, garments, Madame Grey, um, Pierre Cardin dress, uh, lots of really fun silhouettes. Um, this has that sort of one sleeved garment with the big, um, very 1970 uh, polka dots and colors and, um, and I tried to show with my photography how it really flows um, with movement. And then these are some of the antiques that she collected that are at the Cleveland Museum of Art, very interested in French furniture, uh, antique jewelry. Um, oh, good, I did include <laughs> a couple more recent things. So, um, you know, in theory, the exhibit is, went up to 2017. Um, and so this is an earlier, uh, suit. This is 1990s, but um, worn by Susan Hall, who Susan has since moved to Chicago, but she was um, worked in African American history in Cleveland, both at the Historical Society. She worked at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, and Russell Trousseau is a Cleveland designer who made this suit. He's someone he started out as um, his career was as an anesthesiologist, but he had an interest in fashion. Um, and I think, you know, being an anesthesiologist, he could fund that interest. And so it started out with uh, collecting antique lace and making wedding gowns for women in Cleveland. And then he branched out to fashion in general. Um, I don't know if I, well, I'll, I'll show some of his other work later, but then now today he focuses uh, largely on being a jewelry designer. Um, so I thought this was a, a pretty fun um, suit that he made. Local designer. Valerie Mayen, who has a brand called Yellow Cake. She um, gave us this ensemble, which she made in 2014, which is also the year that she was on the reality TV show Project Runway. Um, she didn't win Project Runway, but she was a contestant and made it um, through a certain number of rounds. And she's still working today. Um, a lot of what she sells is online, um, but I like her work because this is a little bit more unusual, but she makes a lot of really good staples, um, leggings, jackets, things that are approachable and affordable for regular folks in Cleveland today. Um, and, um, and she's also really involved in the um, you know, Latina fashion um, world, both in Cleveland and outside of that. So she gave us this for the exhibit. Um, another more recent garment, this was made in 2017 by Dinajwa. Um, you might tell from this portrait that Dinajwa is quite a character. 
Um, she changed her name. Um, Dinajo actually grew up as um, Robert and was uh, the, one of the Cleveland Clinic's first sexual reassignment surgeries um, to be successful. Um, but she, so today she's still working as a designer and she does one of a kind pieces. So this is something, the fabric is actually woven out of tiny strips of VHS tape. And then, um, so it's funny because it's essentially made of plastic, but it is very shimmery and sparkly because um, of the little tiny loops of that uh, tape. Um, and then it has a very strong silhouette. She was really inspired by um, medieval armor and some of the uh, things that she's seen at the Cleveland Museum of Art and at the, um, the Met in New York. So she gave us uh, this ensemble. And then, uh, so Russell Trousseau, who made that sort of gold golden suit earlier, this is the type of jewelry work that he's doing today. Um, he does some really interesting techniques that I think are, um, uh, and not that he invented, but that not a lot of people are doing. So he has a technique of taking large pearls and setting little diamonds in to the surface of the pearl, um, which is pretty fantastic. Um, on the right, we had some jewelry made by Dana Schneider, who um, is from Northeast Ohio, not Cleveland in particular, but she's a jewelry designer. And somehow she sort of ended up getting involved with um, the film industry. And she does a lot of jewelry for movies. So this is the mocking J pin from the Hunger Games. Uh, she's the designer of that. So I think it's pretty cool that we have this Ohio woman who's creating like on-screen jewelry. And so she's worked um, with several uh, films. The more recent version of um, Alice in Wonderland that Johnny Depp starred in, she did some jewelry for that movie. Um, it's just another example. And then if you are ever in Cleveland, there's a shop that's pretty near my house actually um, on the near west side called Fount Leather. And they were winners of LeBron James reality show that he um, created called Cleveland Hustles. And they um, make all kinds of leather goods um, and so they import the leather itself, um, but then everything is made here in their workshop in Cleveland, and they hire a lot of refugees to um, work with them and support them. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a cool business, I think. And so we had some of their work in the show. So all um, contemporary Cleveland designers. Um, and then I do sometimes like to talk about what didn't make it into the show. <laughs> Um, sometimes it's a matter of we just can't find enough out about um, the person, especially in the case of Wow Factor. So I thought this dress, while seemingly kind of simple, it had this cool um, extra padding here. It's from the 19, late 1940s. Um, but uh, the family, I mean, in this case, the family didn't even remember donating the dress to us. There just wasn't a lot of history to go with it that I could uncover. Um, and then uh, this is a French dress by Lucien Lelong. It's really cool. It's um, like a very sheer silk crepe. So the fabric really moves in the wind. Um, the, the back, the whole entire zipper was missing. And so I was still able to dress it on a mannequin, but that it did have some condition issues. Um, but also it turns out that the, the woman's husband was, um, uh, ended up going to, to prison for, um, and, and like, we just didn't want to get into some of those stories. Um, uh, so while I might find them interesting, um, not always what we want to talk about in, in an exhibit. Um, and then um, along those lines, one of my favorite people whose family seems to have uh, hated her <laughs> um, was Mary Pack McNary. And we have, we do have this dress here, which um, she wore in the 1880s, but it's made to look like 1820s. Um, she was very into, and, and everybody in Cleveland in the late 19th century, early 20th century of a certain um, uh, social class did a lot of costume parties, fancy dress parties, they would have called them. Um, and so, you know, here's uh, a photo from one fancy dress party. Here she is dressed as a geisha, which is something that is not socially acceptable today with cultural appropriation and people being more aware of that, but in the time was very fashionable. Um, and so she was very much into dressing up um, for costume parties. Um, and then my favorite photo of her is um, 
Mary Pack McNary with her husband Amos. And here she is on her 50th wedding anniversary, um, attempting to fit into her wedding dress, which sort of still fits her, but um, it, it, it clearly it, it, it doesn't look the same as it probably originally did. And, you know, you wonder, like, what are you trying to prove? And then I was able to get in touch with descendants of the family and through their old letters um, and family stories, it turns out that she was just a really mean woman who was obsessed with keeping up with the Joneses. And so she wasn't right on Euclid Avenue, but she was nearby. And she sort of would, according to the family stories, wander the house with her big ring of keys, you know, keeping all of the good stuff under lock and key. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know, it just, she wasn't super well liked, which is probably true of a lot of people in our collection. You know, not everybody's nice. And just because you have great clothes doesn't mean you're a, <laughs> a wonderful person. But luckily I was able to find enough great stories for the show to talk about, um, you know, fashion, how fashion changed, how life for women changed, um, and some fantastic things that women were doing. Um, so thank you from Mary Pack McNary. <laughs> I'm gonna um, end screen sharing. And I don't know if there's anyone around um, that might have any questions. Um, and is it just me and you? <laughs> no, there's no, there's, 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 there's some others here too. Okay. Um, okay. But um, you did a fantastic job. Um, I don't think there's any, any questions, um, but we really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I think we're envious of you and the fact that you get to um, have fun with, not all fun, but you know, you get to see these costumes and um, kind of all these different things. So um, thank you, Patricia. And um, thank you for, taking out your time and good luck with the baby. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good weekend. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.